This video is brought to you by my favorite sponsor, CuriosityStream. This subscription streaming service offers thousands of nonfiction movies and shows from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. It has millions of subscribers and new shows every week on history, science, tech, military history, and of course, true crime. Curiosity Stream is similar to Netflix, but better in many ways. First of all, the variety of documentaries. I always find something to watch in the first 30 seconds of scrolling. And the price? Well, it's pretty much what I pay for Netflix per month, but that's the yearly price. It's $14.99 per year, guys. Some of you pay more monthly to support my channel. Oh, and it's available on pretty much every device you might have, unless you're using a Nokia 3310 or something. That's right, it's available on their web app, Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, and Apple TV. And here's a recommendation for you as your first documentary on CuriosityStream. Try Combat Obscura. A former combat videographer, Miles Lagozi, presents personal footage of U.S. Marines in the Afghan war zone. It's a groundbreaking look at daily life in the war zone, as told by the Marines themselves. So, do yourself a favor and go to curiositystream.com slash skd for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. If you don't use my link, it'll cost you 25% more. So, click the link in the description and tell me how it went. $14.99 per year is a little over a dollar per month. You're welcome. Now, let's talk crime. The house at number 3 Morehouse Street, Willoughby, on the outskirts of Perth, Western Australia, was an unkempt white brick two-bedroom bungalow. Its garden was overrun with weeds and dead flowers, and it was in bad need of a coat of paint. It was by far the worst house in the street, and the only good thing that could be said about it was that it made the other houses around it look like palaces. Yet this unglamorous dwelling would become the most notorious house in Australia. In the ensuing years, people would slow down and point and whisper as they drove past it. It would become as infamous to Australians as the Chamber of Horrors at 213 Oxford Apartments, Milwaukee, became to Americans, or London's 10 Rillington Place and 25 Cromwell Street became to the British. It was at 213 Oxford Apartments between 1988 to 1991 that Jeffrey Dahmer, a 28-year-old chocolate factory worker, slaughtered 17 young men had non-consensual sex, and mutilated their corpses and ate their body parts. It was at 10 Rillington Place in the early 50s that mild-mannered office clerk and necrophiliac serial killer John Christie murdered his victims, had sex with their corpses, and buried their bodies in the backyard, under the floorboards, and in the wall cavities. It was at 25 Cromwell Street through the 70s and 80s that laborer Fred West and his wife Rose had non-consensual sex, tortured and murdered their victims, and buried nine of their bodies in the backyard. The house at number three, Morehouse Street, was Australia's very own house of horrors. It was the love nest, torture chamber, and killing field of Catherine and David Burney, who, like the Wests, were a husband and wife serial killer team, the rarest form of serial killers in the world. It was here that they committed atrocities to their young female victims. The Burneys weren't particularly fussy about who they murdered, as long as they were female. Their victims' ages ranged from 15 to 31. Whenever the Burnies felt like killing someone, they'd drive along the highways of Perth and pick up hitchhikers or other young women in need of a lift. Their victims never suspected the friendly couple until it was too late. At knife point, they were taken back to Morehouse Street and tied up and abused as the Burnies carried out their sexual fantasies. Then they were murdered. The lucky ones were put to sleep with an overdose of sleeping pills and then strangled. The less fortunate victims were either stabbed or bludgeoned to death with a knife or an axe as they sat in their shallow graves in a secluded pine forest a short drive out of Perth. On November 5, 1986, Detective Sergeant Paul Ferguson was convinced that there was a serial killer on the loose when 21-year-old Denise Karen Brown was reported missing. Denise's disappearance was the fourth young woman in 27 days. That type of thing just didn't happen in Perth. In other large Australian capital cities, such as Sydney or Melbourne, yes, but not in Perth. All of the missing women came from good homes, 
and it was extremely unlikely that any one of them would simply disappear for no good reason, let alone all of them. Ferguson had eliminated all of the possibilities of links between the missing girls and investigated the possibilities of secret boyfriends, married lovers, or hidden drug problems that might cause any of them to disappear. He turned up nothing. Ferguson's instinct, drawn from years of experience, told him that there was a serial killer on the loose a serial killer who had the power to abduct young women and make them disappear. What puzzled Detective Ferguson most was that two of the women hadn't completely disappeared in that friends and relatives had received letters and telephone calls from them after they had been reported missing. 15-year-old Susanna Candy had posted two letters to her parents, one from Perth and the other from the nearby port of Fremantle, in the first two weeks after she'd disappeared. Both letters said that she was well and that she would return home soon. And Denise Brown had phoned a girlfriend the day after she had disappeared to tell her that everything was fine. After that, no one had heard a word. It just didn't add up. Ferguson's gut feeling told him to expect the worst. He consulted former CIB chief Bill Nelson, who agreed with his serial killer theory. And if anyone was entitled to an opinion, it would be the veteran multiple homicide investigator a police officer among the most respected in the state. Bill Nelson was the officer in charge of the hunt for Perth serial killer Eric Edgar Cook, the mild-mannered truck driver who had ruthlessly murdered six people, and possibly two others, in the early 1960s to become the most notorious multiple murderer in Western Australia's history. Nielsen had brought him to justice and saw Cook swing at the end of a rope in Fremantle Prison in 1964. On November 10th, Five days after the disappearance of Denise Brown, Detective Ferguson and Detective Sergeant Vince Kadich were following up leads on Denise's disappearance when they got the breakthrough they were so desperately waiting for. They were told on the two-way radio that a half-naked young woman had just staggered into a small Willoughby shopping complex and had been taken to the Palmyra police station. Thinking that the missing Denise Brown had turned up, Ferguson and Kadich sped to the police station. Instead, it was a 16-year-old girl who told them the most amazing story. The terrified teenager said that she'd been abducted at knife point the previous evening by a man and a woman who asked her directions as she walked along the street near her home in fashionable Nedlands. She was taken to a house in Willoughby where the couple ripped off all of her clothing before chaining her to a bed by her hands and feet. The girl said the man repeatedly forced her to have sex as the woman watched. The couple spoke of injecting cocaine into the head of the man's penis. The following morning, after the man had gone to work, the woman unchained the girl and forced her to telephone her parents and tell them that she was staying with friends and that she was okay. While she was using the phone, she was astute enough to note the number. When the woman left the bedroom to answer the door, presumably to let in a cocaine dealer, the girl found an open window and escaped. She was able to give police a full description of her attackers, along with their telephone number and address. When the girl had told detectives Ferguson and Katich of the phone call she was forced to make to her parents, they immediately became suspicious that the couple may be the kidnappers of the two young women who had disappeared and had wrung their families under suspicious circumstances. Also, there was little doubt in their minds that the fact that the girl was allowed to see the couple's faces and where they lived could mean that she was marked for death once they had finished with her. If this was the case, then it was highly likely that the couple had already killed, perhaps many times, and another death wouldn't matter. The girl led the team of armed detectives to the disheveled white brick house in Morehouse Street. There was no one at home. Two detectives hid in a panel van parked in the driveway and apprehended a very tense and nervous Catherine Margaret Burney when she arrived home. She told them where to look for the man. Minutes later, other detectives picked up John David Burney where he worked as a laborer in a spare parts car yard. The Burneys vigorously denied the girl's allegations. Instead, they claimed that she had been a willing party and had gone with them to share a bong of marijuana. Burney admitted to having sex with the girl, but maintained that he had not forced her to have sex. A search of the house found the girl's bag and a packet of cigarettes that the girl had the common sense to conceal in the ceiling as proof positive that she had actually been there. But there was little else to prove the allegation of non-consensual sex or connect the Burnies with any of the other missing women. Knowing that they needed a confession to confirm their suspicions, Ferguson and Kadich hoped that under intense questioning, one of the Burnies would crack 
and at least admit to the non-consensual sex with the young girl. It was her word against theirs. Ferguson and Kadich grilled the Burnies separately. It was David Burney who eventually cracked. Just after 7 p.m. that evening, Detective Sergeant Kadich said to David Burney, half-jokingly, in reference to the missing women, It's getting dark. Best we take the shovel and dig them up. To his astonishment, Bernie replied, Okay, there's four of them. The detective couldn't believe his ears. When told of her lover's confession, Catherine Bernie also broke. They agreed to take police to the bodies that were buried not far from the city. It was as though it was a load off David Bernie's mind. He spoke freely with the detectives as he directed the convoy of vehicles out of the metropolitan area and toward the state forest north of the city. The convoy moved along Wanneroo Road and through the pine forests. Bernie was so relaxed and chatting so much that they were almost at Yanchep before he realized that they had gone too far and instructed them to turn around and go back. Squinting into the darkness, David Bernie recognized a track that led off the highway and into the darkness of the Gnangara pine plantation. About 400 yards into the forest, Bernie instructed them to stop. He pointed to a mound of sand. Dig there, he said. Within minutes, police had uncovered the corpse of Denise Karen Brown, who had been reported missing only five days earlier. With a guard placed around the shallow grave, Bernie directed the convoy south to the Glen Eagle picnic area on the Albany Highway near Armadale. After traveling for half an hour, Bernie guided police into the forest and along a narrow track. Up an incline about 40 yards from the track, police uncovered the decomposing body of 22-year-old Mary Frances Nielsen, who had gone missing on October 6th. A further kilometer down the track, David Burney pointed out the burial site of 15-year-old Susanna Candy, who hadn't been seen since October 19th. Detective Sergeant Kadich was amazed that neither of the Burneys showed any emotion or embarrassment while the bodies were being uncovered. If anything, they appeared to enjoy being the center of attention as they pointed the graves out to police. Then, Catherine Burney said that it was her turn. She would like to indicate the position of the next grave. She pointed out that it was where they had buried 31-year-old Noeline Patterson, who they had kidnapped and murdered on the 30th of October. Catherine Burney went to great lengths to explain to police that she disliked Noeline from the moment that she and David had abducted her. She was glad that she was dead. As she pointed out the grave to the police, she spat on it. She showed a great deal of pride in being able to find the grave unassisted. It was as if she didn't want David Burney to get all of the credit. As they left the burial grounds, David Burney commented to Kadich, what a pointless loss of young life. There was absolutely no doubt in the detective's mind that if the young girl hadn't escaped earlier in the day, the killings would have gone on. Psychiatrists attached to the case agreed that Catherine Burney could not have killed on her own. She just wasn't the type. But the quiet mother of six children was totally obsessed with David Burney and would do anything for him, including murder. She was even prepared to take her own life for him. When he got too fond of one of their victims, Catherine turned the knife on herself and said that she would rather die by her own hand than see him fall in love with anyone else. David Burney was a completely different story. The product of a desperately poor family, he'd been in and out of institutions and prisons all of his life and was always going to end up in jail for a long time. But no one could possibly have forecast the magnitude of his crimes. David John Burney was the eldest of six children. Margaret and John Burney did their best for their kids, but times were tough. For all of their young lives, the authorities periodically took the children away from their parents and placed them in government institutions. David Burney's parents had a long history of chronic alcoholism. At the time of the murders, David Burney's mother was living in destitute squalor. Her tiny apartment was overflowing with food scraps, dirty dishes, full ashtrays, and broken furniture. The place was covered in dust and grime. She had given up hope years ago and could not recall seeing her eldest son in years. David Burney's father died in 1986 after a long illness. Catherine and David first met as youngsters when their families lived next door to each other. Catherine's life was also one of doom and despair. Her mother died when she was 10 months old, and the infant went to live in South Africa with her father. She was bundled back to Australia after two years and was fostered by her grandparents. A sad little girl who rarely smiled, she had no friends. 
other children weren't allowed to play with her, and even before she reached high school, her mind was scarred by loneliness. She desperately wanted to be loved. She would find that love in David Burney later on in her sad life, but it would drive her to a loneliness and despair that she never knew was possible. David Burney was reunited with Catherine when they were both in their late teens. David already had an extensive record for juvenile offenses. The only time that he showed that he might make something of himself was in the early 1960s when he trained as an apprentice jockey. But like most things in David Burney's life, that didn't last long. Trainer Eric Parnham recalled Bernie as a pale, sickly-looking boy who he took on just to give him a job. Bernie was recommended as an apprentice prospect, and Parnham went to pick the boy up at his home. The house was a derelict slum surrounded by a pack of dogs. Bernie stayed in the stables for almost a year and showed enough ability to become a good jockey. Parnham eventually sacked him when he was alleged to have bashed and robbed the elderly owner of a boarding house. Catherine found a friend in Bernie. She would do anything he desired, and together they went on a crime rampage that would land them both in jail. On June 11, 1969, David and Catherine pleaded guilty in the Perth Police Court to 11 charges of breaking, entering, and stealing goods worth nearly $3,000. The court was told that Catherine was pregnant to another man. They admitted to stealing oxyacetylene equipment and using it to try to crack a safe at the Waverley Drive-In Theater. Catherine was placed on probation, and Bernie was sent to jail for nine months. On the 9th of July, 1969, they were committed for trial in the Supreme Court on eight further charges of breaking, entering, and stealing. They pleaded guilty, and Bernie had three years' imprisonment added to his sentence. Catherine was put on probation for a further four years. On the 21st of June, 1970, Bernie broke out of Carnet Prison and teamed up with Catherine again. When they were apprehended on the 10th of July, they were charged with 53 counts of stealing, receiving, breaking and entering, being unlawfully on premises, unlawfully driving motor vehicles, and unlawfully using vehicles. In their possession, police found clothing, wigs, bedding, radios, food, books, 100 sticks of gelignite, 120 detonators, and three fuses. Catherine admitted that she knew that she had done wrong, but said that she loved Bernie so much that there was nothing that she wouldn't do for him. She would get her chance to prove this in the years to come. Bernie was sentenced to two and a half years in prison and Catherine received six months. Her newborn baby was taken from her by welfare workers and held until her release. Out of prison a few months later and away from the evil influence of David Bernie, Catherine went to work as a live-in domestic for a family in Fremantle. For the first time in her life, the scrawny young woman seemed to have found some happiness. Donald McLaughlin, the son of the family she worked for, fell in love with her and they married on the 31st of May, 1972. It was also Catherine's 21st birthday. Shortly after, she gave birth to the first of their six children. They named the baby boy Little Donnie after his father. Seven months later, Donnie was killed when he was crushed to death by a car in front of his mother. Psychiatrists would later ponder the significance of this tragedy and the horrors of the future. In the meantime, the marriage was not a happy one. Catherine pined for David Burney. No one was surprised when she bailed out of the marriage. The family had been living in a state housing commission home in the working-class suburb of Victoria Park. Catherine had to look after her unemployed husband, their six children, and her father and uncle. The place was like a pigsty. She took no pride in the kids or the house. There was never any money for food. One day she rang her husband and said that she wasn't coming back. She'd been seeing David Burney for the previous two years and was going back to him. After 13 years apart, she moved back with David Burney. Although they never married, Catherine changed her name to Burney by deed poll and became his common-law wife. But the Burney household was far from normal. David Burney's sexual appetite was seemingly insatiable. James Burney, David's younger brother, stayed with the couple for a short time when he was released from prison after serving five months for indecently interfering with his six-year-old niece. He told a reporter, The six-year-old led me on. You don't know what they can be like. When I left prison, I had nowhere to go. I couldn't go back to my mother's place because I had assaulted her and there was a restraining order out against me. I had a couple of fights with my mom and the police chased me off. Mom has alcohol problems. So David and Catherine let me move in. 
They weren't really happy about it and David kept saying that he was going to kill me to keep me in line. James added that David Burney had few friends, was heavily into kinky sex, and had a big pornographic video collection. He has to have sex four or five times a day, James said of his brother. I saw him use a hypodermic of that stuff you have when they're going to put stitches in your leg. It makes you numb. He put the needle in his penis. Then he had sex. David has had many women. He always has someone. The killing started in 1986. David and Catherine Burney had tried everything sexually together and they wanted new kicks. They discussed abduction and non-consensual sex. Burney turned his accomplice on by telling her that she would achieve incredible orgasms by watching him penetrate another woman who was bound and gagged. Catherine believed him. Their first opportunity came on the 6th of October, 1986, when a 22-year-old student, Mary Nielsen, turned up at the Burney house to buy some car tires. She had approached Bernie at his work at the spare parts yard, and he had suggested that she call by his house for a better bargain. Mary was studying psychology at the University of Western Australia and worked part-time at a suburban delicatessen. She was hoping to take a job as a counsellor with the community welfare department. Her parents were both TAFE lecturers and were in the UK on holiday when their daughter disappeared. Mary was last seen leaving the shop on Monday the 6th of October to attend a university lecture but she never made it. Her gallant sedan was left six days later, left in a riverside car park opposite police headquarters. David Burney had driven it there. It was as if he was leaving a clue. As Mary Nielsen entered the Burney house, she was seized at knife point, bound and gagged, and chained to the bed. Catherine Burney watched as her lover repeatedly had non-consensual sex with the girl. She asked him questions about what turned him on the most. This way, she would know what to do to excite him. Catherine knew that Mary Nielsen would eventually have to die, but it was something that she and Bernie hadn't yet discussed. That night, they took the girl to the Glen Eagles National Park, where Bernie had non-consensual sex with her again, then wrapped a nylon cord around her neck and slowly tightened it with a tree branch. Mary Nielsen choked to death at his feet. Bernie then stabbed her through the body and buried her in a shallow grave. He told Catherine that the stab wound would allow any gases to escape as the body decomposed. He had read it somewhere in a book. The second killing took place a fortnight later when they abducted pretty 15-year-old Susanna Candy as she hitchhiked along the Sterling Highway in Claremont. An outstanding student at the Hollywood High School, Susanna lived at home in Nedlands with her parents, two brothers, and a sister. Her father is one of the top ophthalmic surgeons in Western Australia. After she went missing, the Bernies forced her to send letters to her family to assure them that she was all right, but the family feared for her life. The Bernies had been cruising for hours looking for a victim when they spotted Susanna. Within seconds of being in the car, she had a knife at her throat and her hands were bound. She was taken back to the Willoughby house where she was gagged, chained to the bed, and forced to have sex. After Bernie had finished raping the girl, Catherine Bernie got into the bed with them. She now knew that this turned her lover on. When they had satiated their lust, Bernie tried to strangle the girl with the nylon cord, but she became hysterical and went berserk. The Bernies forced sleeping pills down her throat to calm her down. Once Susanna was asleep, David put the cord around her neck and told Catherine to prove her undying love for him by murdering the girl. Catherine obliged willingly. She tightened the cord slowly around the young girl's neck until she stopped breathing. David Bernie stood beside the bed watching. Asked later why she had done it, Catherine Burney said, because I wanted to see how strong I was within my inner self. I didn't feel a thing. It was like I expected. I was prepared to follow him to the end of the earth and do anything to see that his desires were satisfied. She was a female. Females hurt and destroy males. They buried Susanna Candy near the grave of Mary Nielsen in the state forest. On the 1st of November, they saw 31-year-old Noeline Patterson standing beside her car on the Canning Highway, East Fremantle. She had run out of petrol while on her way home from her job as bar manager at the Nedlands Golf Club. Noeline lived with her mother in the leafy suburb of Bicton on the shores of the Swan River. She was an extremely popular lady and club members described her as charming and polite. She had been an air hostess with Ansett Airlines for nine years and had worked for corporate tycoon Alan Bond as hostess on his private jet for two years. 
Noeline had been working at the golf club for about a year when she accepted the Bernie's offer of a lift. Noeline didn't hesitate to get in the car with a friendly couple. Once inside, she had a knife held to her throat, was tied up and told not to move or she would be stabbed to death. She was taken back to Morehouse Street, where Bernie repeatedly forced her to have sex after she was gagged and chained to the bed. Catherine Bernie hated Noeline Patterson from the minute she set eyes on her. A beautiful, elegant lady, Noeline had everything that Catherine wanted to be. What's more, Bernie was entranced by her. They had originally decided to murder Noeline Patterson that same night, but when David Bernie kept putting it off, Catherine became infuriated. She could see that she was losing her man. At one stage, she held a knife to her own heart and threatened to kill herself unless he chose between them. Bernie kept Noeline prisoner in the house for three days before Catherine insisted that he kill her. He forced an overdose of sleeping pills down her throat and strangled her, under the watchful eye of Catherine, while she slept. They took her body to the forest and buried it along with the others. Catherine Bernie got great pleasure in throwing sand in the dead woman's face. On the 5th of November, they abducted 21-year-old Denise Brown as she was waiting for a bus on Sterling Highway. Denise was a fun-loving girl who worked as a part-time computer operator in Perth and spent a lot of her spare time at dances and nightclubs. She shared a flat in Nedlands with her boyfriend and another couple. Denise spent her last night at the Cool Bell Up Hotel with a girlfriend. She accepted a lift from the Burnies outside the Stoned Crow Wine House in Fremantle. A close friend said later, she was someone who would do anything to help anyone. She trusted too many people. Perhaps that's why she didn't think twice about taking a lift. At knife point, Denise was taken to the house in Willoughby, chained to the bed and forced to have sex. The following afternoon, she was taken to the Wanneroo Pine Plantation. Along the way, they nearly picked up another victim. After the Bernie's capture, a 19-year-old student told police how she was offered a lift by two people who she later recognized as Catherine and David Burney from photos in the newspapers. After finishing university for the day, she was walking along Pinjar Road, Wanneroo, when a car pulled up beside her. There were two people in the front and another slumped in the back seat. Later she realized that the person in the back was probably Denise Brown. She went on, I felt uneasy. I didn't recognize the car. There was a man driving and a woman in the front seat of the car. The man kept looking down, not looking at me, and the woman was drinking a can of UDL rum and coke. I thought the fact that she was drinking at that time of day was strange. He didn't look at me the whole time. It was the woman who did all the talking. She asked me if I wanted a lift anywhere. I said, no, I only live up the road. They continued to sit there and I looked into the back seat where I saw a small person with short brown hair lying across the seat. I thought it must have been their son or daughter asleep in the back. The person was in a sleeping position and from the haircut, looked like a boy but for some reason I got the feeling it was a girl. I told them again I didn't want to lift because walking was good exercise. The man looked up for the first time and gazed at me before looking away again. By this time, more cars had appeared and I started to walk away, but they continued to sit in the car. Finally, the car started, and they did another U-turn and drove up Pinjar Road towards the pine plantation. It wasn't until I saw a really good photo of Catherine Burney that I realized who they were. Somebody must have been looking after me that day. I don't know what would have happened to me if I had got into that car. Safely in the seclusion of the forest, David Burney forced Denise Brown to have sex in the car while the couple waited for darkness. They then dragged the woman from the car and Bernie assaulted her again. In the light of Catherine's torch, Bernie plunged a knife into Denise's neck while he was raping her. Denise didn't die straight away. Catherine Bernie, still holding the torch, found a bigger knife and urged her lover to stab her again. He didn't need much prompting. He wielded the knife until Denise lay silent at his feet. Convinced that the girl was dead, they dug a shallow grave and lay her body in it. As they were covering Denise Brown with sand, she sat up in the grave. Bernie grabbed an axe and struck her full force on the skull with it. When the girl sat up again, he turned the axe head around and cracked the girl's skull open. Then they finished covering her with sand. The brutal murder of Denise Brown had a bad effect on Catherine Bernie. She liked the sex they had with their victims, and she didn't mind the women being strangled and stabbed to death. But after the last murder, she decided that she couldn't go through it again. 
That is possibly why she left their next victim untied and alone in the bedroom. She told police later, I think I must have come to a decision that sooner or later there had to be an end to the rampage. I had reached the stage when I didn't know what to do. I suppose I came to a decision that I was prepared to give her a chance. I knew that it was a foregone conclusion that David would kill her and probably do it that night. I was just fed up with the killings. I thought if something did not happen soon, it would simply go on and on and never end. Deep and dark in the back of my mind was yet another fear. I had a great fear that I would have to look at another killing like that of Denise Brown, the girl he murdered with the axe. I wanted to avoid that at all costs. In the back of my mind, I had come to the position where I really did not care if the girl escaped or not. When I found out that the girl had escaped, I felt a twinge of terror run down my spine. I thought to myself, David will be furious. What shall I tell him? On the 12th of November, 1986, David John Burney and Catherine Margaret Burney appeared in Fremantle Magistrates Court, charged with four counts of willful murder. The public were outraged at the allegations against the pair, and a crowd had gathered outside the court. Police checked the bags of everyone entering the court. The holding cell leading to the courtroom was heavily guarded by police. David Burney was led into court handcuffed to a policeman and wearing a faded pair of blue overalls with joggers and socks. The barefoot Catherine Burney was handcuffed to a policeman and wore a pair of blue denim jeans with a light brown checked shirt. They stood emotionless as the charges against them were read out. Neither had legal representation. No plea was entered, bail was officially refused, and the Burneys were remanded in custody. When asked if she wanted to be remanded for eight or thirty days before her next court appearance, Catherine Burney looked at her lover and said, I'll go when he goes. On the 10th of February, 1987, a huge crowd gathered outside the Perth Supreme Court. As the Burneys arrived in a prison truck, they called for the reintroduction of the death penalty. Hang the bastards, they called. String them up. Under a huge police guard, the couple were led into the holding cells. Bill Power, the police rounds reporter who covered the Burneys' crimes and trial for the Perth Daily News, recalls the Burney's appearance in the Perth Supreme Court as one of the most chilling experiences of his career and remembers it as if it were yesterday. There was nothing distinctive about David and Catherine Burney when they first appeared in court to face multiple murder charges in the serial killings that brought to an end the mystery of the young women going missing off Perth streets, Bill recalled. They were a rather nondescript, ordinary-looking couple you might find running a petrol station in a country town. David was a weedy little man, and Catherine his drab, slightly buxom wife with a very sour face. Both were accompanied by male police officers. David Burney appeared first at the top of the stairs from the holding cell beneath the court and looked totally out of place in the majestic Perth Supreme Court. He was already in the dock glancing around at the masked police, court staff and huge media contingent as Catherine made her way up the stairs to the courtroom. The scrawny little serial killer was mesmerizing enough but nothing could have prepared me for the moment that Catherine Burney appeared at the top of the Jara staircase leading up to the dock where the charges were to be read out to them. If you've ever witnessed a wild cat go off, then try and imagine that same hellcat in the confined spaces of a narrow staircase. Catherine Burney fought against the guarding police officers and refused to allow any of them to touch her as she screamed and spat her words at them until she reached the dock and spotted her beloved David. Only then did she calm down. The unusualness of her appearance continued when David Burney stood before the court to hear the murder charges read against him, and Catherine Burney was allowed to sit on a small wooden bench immediately behind him. As the judge leveled the horrible case against him, Burney stood motionless with his hands clasped behind his back. What I witness next, I will take to the grave with me, Bill Power recalled. As the heinous charges of abduction, non-consensual sex, torture, and murder were being read out against him, Catherine Burney bent forward, stretched out her right hand, and gently stroked the ball of David Burney's thumb behind his back. There has probably never before been such a declaration of undying love in the Western Australian Supreme Court dock. David Burney pleaded guilty to four counts of murder and one count of abduction and non-consensual sex, thereby sparing the families of his victims the agony of a long trial. That's the least I could do, he told the detective. Catherine Burney had not been required to plead as her barrister was waiting on a psychiatric report to determine her sanity. 
She was remanded to appear later that month. It was all over within a few minutes, recalled Bill Power. And the erstwhile angelic Catherine, who moments before had acted out such a show of dedication, was dragged kicking and screaming and spitting down the wooden staircase to a prison van waiting beside the court. Perhaps she never wanted another man besides David to touch her. Mr. Justice Wallace sentenced David Burney to the maximum sentence of life imprisonment with strict security. He added, The law is not strong enough to express the community's horror at this sadistic killer who tortured and murdered four women. In my opinion, David John Burney is such a danger to society that he should never be released from prison. David Burney stood trembling in the dock as the sentence was passed. His bravado returned as he was led to the prison van under tight security. With the angry mob calling for his blood, David Burney put his hands to his lips and blew them a kiss. Found sane enough to plead, Catherine Margaret Burney admitted her part in the murders and was sentenced on the 3rd of March 1987 in the Perth Supreme Court. She stood in the dock holding hands with David Burney, the man who had led her down the path of torture, non-consensual sex, and murder. Throughout the day's hearing, they chatted quietly and smiled at each other as the court was told of their 35-day reign of horror. On occasions, she would stroke and pat his arm. A psychiatrist to the court said that Catherine was totally dependent on Bernie and almost totally vulnerable to his evil influence. He said, It's the worst case of personality dependence I've ever seen in my career. Mr. Justice Wallace had no hesitation in handing down the same sentence as that imposed on David Bernie. He said, in my opinion, you should never be released to be with David Burney. You should never be allowed to see him again. As she was taken from the court, the scrawny mother of six took one last look at the man who had influenced her life so strongly and so disastrously. In prison, David Burney was repeatedly beaten up and attempted suicide later in 1987 and was eventually moved to Fremantle Prison's old death cells for his own protection. In the years to come, the Burnies would rarely be out of the headlines. In their first four years apart, they exchanged 2,600 letters, but they were denied the right to marry, have personal phone calls to each other, or have contact visits. In 1990, David Burney claimed that the denial of these rights imposed a punishment over and above that decreed by the law. He said he and Catherine were suffering physical and mental torture, and that denying them contact with each other was an attempt to drive them into mental breakdown and suicide. In 1992, major crime squad detectives gave David Burney the rare privilege of a look at the outside world when they drove him around Perth and the suburbs for five hours in the hopes that he may confess to other murders that he could have possibly committed. Nothing ever came of it. In 1993, David Burney's personal computer was confiscated from his cell in the protection unit at Casarina Prison when it was found to contain pornographic software. On January 22, 2000, Catherine Burney's first husband and the father of her six children, Donald McLaughlin, passed away suddenly in the Western Australia country town of Brusselton. He was aged 59. Catherine Burney made an application to attend her former husband's funeral. It was refused. Commenting on the Ministry of Justice's decision to refuse attendance to the funeral, the Western Australia Premier, Mr. Richard Court, said, As far as I'm concerned, the Burneys have forfeited any right for those types of privileges. According to Western Australian law, David and Catherine Burney will be eligible to apply for parole in 20 years after they committed their atrocities. But it seems that there is little likelihood that any parole board would go against Mr. Justice Wallace's recommendation that they die behind bars. In January 2000, the acting Western Australian Attorney General, Mr. Kevin Prince, said that while the Burneys can be considered for parole in 2007, he thought they would never be released until they became too frail or senile.